who will ask our youth over to the table to come up and we'll begin our Quranic recitation and shortly thereafter, inshallah, we'll begin our lecture. Let's go, brother. future equipped with the word of Allah going forward 
And inshallah, this is much more valuable as an investment that anybody could invest in their, their youth. I don't care the fact that we're getting over by not paying when we send our children to the school of the Kufar, we pay. We pay. There is nothing that the Muslim can be saved by except the remembrance of Allah. Alone. La sharika la. Without any part. Thank you, brother. I was talking with a co-worker the other day <coughs> that was a non-Muslim. And uh, this individual, he wanted me to read a book and he said that he wanted me to pass the book on to the Muslims because it was so important. Some crackpot joker. <laughs> this is exactly the way I thought about it. And I just nodded my head. And I said to him, I said, you know, my friend, I have to be honest with you. We the Muslims feel kind of sorry for you. He said, why is that? I said, because the Yahud, they have a text. They have a text by their revelation, which they can come and say, anybody that wants to dispute with our revelation, here it is. I said, the Muslims, we just saw that Gorbachev gave back a Quran that's probably dated back to the 10th century. I said, anybody who wants to dispute with the Muslim about his book, we got a text to say, there it is. I said, now the Christians... And I presume that you are a Christian. He said, yes, I am. I said, I don't know which copy of the Bible is the actual text. I said, and when you really, really think about it, that's kind of sad. Because if you're trying to find your way through the maze of life, and you have over 700 different copies that give you different versions, how do you know which way is the song? You don't. I said, so I have to feel very sorry for you. Brothers and sisters, I don't want to belabor what we're here for, and I don't want to break anybody's back to give any glowing accolades. You know, we know the fruit. We know the fruit of the tree. And we've just saw that. So I think that what we want to do at this particular point is have our Imam, Imam Dawud Adid, to come forward and continue on with the next phase of our program. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعض فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وعاله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل دلالة في النار وبعض All praises due to Allah, 
we laud him, beseech his help, and in him we seek forgiveness. And we seek the refuge of Allah from the mischievousness of our souls and the wrongdoings of all of our actions. Whoever Allah guides, no one can lead him astray. And whoever Allah leads to be left astray, no one can guide him. And I bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship as a deity except Allah. He is alone, he has no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his abd and his rasul. O you who believe, fear Allah with just fear and do not die except in the state of Al-Islam. And before I recite the other two verses, translating them into the English language, and then the statement of the Messenger of Allah in this khutbah to Hajat, I would like to just say that this particular ayah that we just recited, فَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ Do not die except in the state of Islam. I would like to just talk maybe two minutes about this because before coming to Rutgers University for this speech, of which of course Sheikh Ghassan was supposed to be doing, but because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written that he would be in a car accident and not be here and not be in his place, I received a telephone call from a friend of mine from Middletown, New York, who told me that another friend of mine, a brother Hanif Abdul Rahman, and his wife were on their way to Syracuse, New York, to a wedding, to witness another friend of mine who was supposed to be getting married. And while they were driving on the road to Syracuse, as we know in that part of New York, snow usually comes to them earlier. And the conditions were very, very bad, and it was almost zero visibility. There were two vans in front of the van that brother Hanif Abdul Rahman, Habibullah, may Allah protect him and preserve him, and his wife Rose and their three children, <coughs> they were the third van. And because of zero visibility, they lost control of the car, and his wife was killed instantly. This happened yesterday morning. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this particular verse in Khutbah to Haja Ya ayyuha ladheena amanu ittaqullah O you who believe fear Allah haqqa tuqati with just fear wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun and do not die except in the state of Islam and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give this sister rule the wife of Ab, uh, Hanif Abdul Rahman, the highest place in Jannah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy on him and his children for the loss of his wife and their mother. After this, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to recite the second verse in Khutbah al-Hajjah. <coughs> o human beings, fear your Lord who created you from one soul, Adam, alayhi salatu wasalam. The same Prophet whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that made a mistake, he slipped in the garden, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him and his wife, Hawa, to go down all of you. Qul nahbitu minha jami'a. All of you go down from the Jannah, from the paradise of Allah to the earth. And this soul that Allah created us from, and from the mate, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took from the rib of Adam as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has explained to us from the two of them all of the people that you see sitting here and all the people that you do not see came from these two individuals and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has inspired the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his khutbah al haja to say and remember the relationship and the wombs that bore you, the relationship and ties that you have among you. And fear your Lord, for surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a raqib over you, is a watcher over you. And then the third verse, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, ittaqullah. O you who believe, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa qulu khawlan sadida. And say a word that is correct, that is straight. يُسْلِحْ لَكُمْ أَعْمَالَكُمْ يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ He will correct your deeds for you and he will forgive you of your sins. Surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this ayah, if we do this, Allah will repair our conditions for us 
and forgive us of our sins, and whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger, they have already achieved the greatest of successes. And as to what follows, surely the best speech is the Book of Allah, and the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad, and the worst of all affairs are newly invented matters. For every newly invented matter is an ovation, every innovation is astray, and every astray is in the hellfire. Assalamu alaikum. <coughs> Unfortunately, this particular topic, our responsibility, our children, is a topic that has been talked about too many times. Too many times. And I'm saying it's been talked about too many times. I'm saying it not in light of the verse of Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as dhikra tenfa'ul mu'mineen, to remind the benefits of believers. I'm saying that it's been mentioned and lectured upon too many times in the sense that we don't do anything about what we hear in the lecture. For some strange reason, maybe not the majority of us, but some of us, we go to lectures, we go to halaqat, we go to the Jum'ah khutbah, we go to classes, it either goes in one ear and out the other, or we just go for entertainment. That's it. When the words of Allah in his book and the words of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the authentic hadith should be implemented immediately as soon as we hear them. Our responsibility as parents, as teachers, as leaders to our children is a responsibility that can be summed up in one verse and one hadith. One verse and one hadith. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. O you who believe, save yourselves and your family from the fire. This is one part of this verse. It's sufficient. And if we knew the meaning of this ayah, probably the vast majority of us, if we had the ability, we would get up right now and move to a Muslim country. If we really knew the real meaning of this ayah, if we really understood and had the ability to make the move, if we really, really understood this ayah, we would all get up out of our chairs right now, forget this lecture, and make hijrah. If we really understood what it means by save yourselves and your family. But for those of us, for some strange reason, who choose to stay in this country, we have to continue the lecture, if you understand what I mean. For those of us, for some strange reason, that choose to remain in this country, for whatever reason you choose, we have to continue the lecture. Allah says, O oh, you who believe, O oh, you, oh, you who believe, save yourself and your family from the fire, from the fire. A fire of which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alayha malaika. Over this fire are angels. Ghilavun shidad. It's a fierce, blazing, tormenting fire that these angels are over, and these angels are strong, severely strong. Brothers and sisters in Islam, this ayah, when explained by some of the companions and some of the tabi'un, their companions and students, like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and Mujahid, when they explained this ayah, they themselves didn't give a long elaboration. It needs no long elaboration. It simply means that you should teach your family, meaning your wives and your children, which the benefit of you teaching them will be the result of you saving yourselves and them from the fire. How is it that you and you're trying to protect yourselves and your family from the fire and you're teaching them to obey Allah and obey the Messenger of Allah, how is that going to help you? How is your teaching your children the responsibility that you have and included in it are your wives, how is it that it's going to help you? Let's look at one hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Al-Mayyitu yu'azzabu fi qabrihi bima niha alayhi الميت يعذب في قبره بما نيح عليه 
أو عليها. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam just to give us a small example of why you help protect yourself when you educate your children and your family. That the dead person is going to be punished in his grave because of the moaning and the wailing of his loved one. How is it that this person is going to be punished in the grave? He's dead and gone because of something that his family did. When no soul bears the burden of another soul, how can it be? The dead person is going to be punished because of the moaning and the wailing. In the because of the wailing and moaning and extreme excessive crying of their loved ones that they left behind. Why? It's because he didn't teach them before he died not to do that. Because he didn't teach them not to do just that one little thing, he's going to be punished. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. O you who believe, save yourself. Firstly. And then Allah says, and your family. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'oolun an ra'iyatihi. He says, every one of you is a shepherd. Every single one of you is a shepherd. And each one is responsible for his flock. فَالْإِمَامُ رَاعٍ وَهُوَ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنُ رَعِيَّتِهِ The imam or the leader of a people is a shepherd. And he's responsible for them. وَالرَّجُلُ رَاعٍ فِي أَهْلِهِ and a man is a shepherd concerning his family. And he is responsible over them. And the woman, and listen to the words closely, the woman is a shepherdess in the house of her husband. And she is going to be responsible for that which is under her responsibility in her care. She is a shepherdess in the house of her husband. And she's going to be responsible for the house and the children. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, وَالْخَادِمُ رَاعٍ فِي مَالِ سَيِّدِهِ And the slave is a guardian of his master's property. And for those of us who may not be aware, slavery is a part of Islam and it will be here until Yom al -Qiyamah. And we're not talking about the type of slavery that some people have gone through in this country, in this part of the world, or other parts of the world. We're talking about the legalized Islamic slavery. That the servant is a shepherd and the property concerning the property of his master. And he's going to be held responsible for that. وَالرَّجُلُ رَاعٍ فِي مَالِ أَبِيهِ وَهُوَ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنُ رَعِيَّتِهِ And a man is a shepherd concerning the wealth or the property of his father and he's going to be held as responsible for that. And then the Prophet ﷺ said فَكُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنُ رَعِيَّتِهِ All of you are a shepherd and all of you are going to be held responsible for those or those things that are under your charge. Brothers and sisters in Islam, the upbringing, the caring, the nurturing, the education of our children is extremely important. Extremely important. It is so important that even the pagan Arabs before the Quran was revealed the pagan Arabs who didn't even have a book to guide them, didn't have a messenger to guide them, nor a prophet. They used to send their children out into the desert so that they could be trained about some of the mores and the customs that would make them more productive. They used to send them out so that they can get a further education, to make them protected from those things that they felt would harm them. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in this this beautiful hadith that we've just recited, in his statement that all of us are shepherds, he's explaining to us that no one can get around the situation 
of being responsible over something. All of us are going to be responsible for something. Every single one of us. These boys that you just heard reciting the Quran, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instills in them the Quran and the ability to implement it. That they memorize the Quran in its entirety and that they implement it. But the responsibility that we have over them as shepherds doesn't stop with them. We have to be responsible for ourselves and stop getting out of this idea and this notion that it's over with me and I'm only thinking about them. If we really want to talk about the responsibility that we have over our children or that our children are a responsibility, then the very first thing that we have to do before this child is born is we have to look for a good mate. Because the person that you select to be your wife, to bear your children, has a direct impact on the responsibility you have with these children. Before the child is even born, that child has the right that you select a good woman. I'll say it again. Before that child is even born, the selection that you make, that child has a right that you choose the right type of woman for that child to come through her womb. I'll say it one more time. That child that's not even born yet, not even conceived yet, has the right to tell his father, in a figurative sense, before I come to this existence, you better get, a, get the right woman for me to come through and to educate me. This is what we mean. Because this whole dunya, the whole thing is cursed. The Prophet Wasallam said it, at dunya mal'una. The whole dunya is cursed. And in another hadith, in another hadith, the Prophet said, Ad dunya mata'a, wa khayr mata'i dunya imra'atun saliha, or al imra'atun saliha. He said that dunya is nothing but a commodity. It's nothing but a commodity. And the best of the commodities in this dunya is a virtuous, obedient, respectful, Allah fearing woman. So, that means. The first responsibility that the men have is choosing the right woman for that child to come into this existence. The rites of passage that that child is going to have for those people who are following the kuffar for the rites of passage, the real rites of passage begins with the selection of your woman. That's where it begins. Because the passage, which is al-barzakh, which leads us to either the Jannah or an nar and may Allah give us the Jannah and keep us far away from the nar is going to be almost totally contingent on that woman. Alhamdulillah, the Prophet said women are married for four, meaning four reasons. And we all know the hadith, both males and females among the ummah, we all know this hadith, whether in Arabic or English or whatever, or we can paraphrase it. For her beauty, for her wealth, for her lineage, and for her being. So when we, the men of Islam, select these women, what should we be looking at? We should be looking at what the Prophet ﷺ made an emphasis on in that hadith. Marry the one with the deen. You'll get an abundance of benefits. Why? Because that's where the responsibility of us, we the men, and the women come from. The selection of that woman. This challenge, brothers and sisters, is compounded. It's compounded by living in this country. For those of us who choose to remain here, know for a surety, it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. That the kufr and the shirk, the abomination, the lewdness, is going to have an effect. Some greater than others, but it, it has to have an effect on our children. It's compounded. It's exacerbated by living in this country. The very first thing, of course, brothers and sisters in Islam, that we should be concerned with is Islamic education. The education of our children 
is the number one priority. We've said it before, we don't want to badger you and keep shooting you and beating a dead horse. But how could it be that we really understood this ayah in the context of those who want to stay in this country? In the context of those or relative to those who want to remain in this country and claiming that we understand that ayah, oh you who believe, save yourselves and your family from the fire. How could it be that we would give our children over to the kuffar nesu? How could it be if we claim that we understand this verse that we would give our children to the public school for them to teach them. How could it be? There are so many things, brothers and sisters, that are lost. There are so many things that are lost by sending our children to the kuffar for them to educate them. And we don't have to enumerate them because we all know them. We see the casualties every day. You who are Muslim terrorists, who send your children to the public school, I call you Muslim terrorists. You're worse than the people who blow up buildings. Because you're blowing up your children's souls. You're shooting and destroying and burning and corrupting your children's souls. When you send them to the public school, you are Muslim terrorists or worse. But I don't have enough money. They're too expensive. The Muslim schools are too expensive. Or the education is substandard. Your, your teachers are not accredited. They don't have certification. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu qu anfusukum wa ahlikum nara. O you who believe, save yourself and your family from the fire. It would be better for you to allow them to go to a school, and I know this is going to sound fanatical, and I'm not a fanatic, contrary to popular belief. I'm not an extremist, contrary to popular belief. But it will be better for them, based on that verse, 66th chapter, 6th verse. It will be better for them not to be able to learn how to read and write English, and learn about their Lord. That's not fanaticism, brothers and sisters. As Ibn Qayyim al jawziyyah said, Rahimahullah, إِنَّ الْعَبْدَ لَوْ عَرَفَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ وَلَمْ يَعْرِفْ رَبَّهُ فَكَأَنَّهُ لَمْ يَعْرُفْ شَيْئًا That the slave of Allah, if he knew everything, and he didn't know his Lord, is it as though he doesn't know anything. It would be better for your children to know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, and know who his messenger is, and know about the Sahaba instead of know about knowing about Go Go Power Rangers. It would be better for you to teach them that and let them go to a Muslim school where they can't learn the science developed by the Muslims called algebra. With the hope that they'll learn it later or along with it. It would be better for them to know that than if they know everything if they didn't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنُ رَعِيَّتِهِ all of you are shepherds and you're all going to be called to account for those things that are on your responsibility. You're all going to be responsible. This Islamic education, brothers and sisters, in Islam is extremely vital. The only thing in the entire Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to ask him, Allah azza wa jal, to increase him in was knowledge. The only thing. Why? It's because, once again, if you don't know your Lord, it is as though you don't know anything. The Prophet was commanded by Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was commanded to say, Oh my Lord, increase me in knowledge. What type of knowledge is this? This is beneficial knowledge. Knowledge that benefits us in this life and in the next life. There's no way in this world, in the universe, that this university, Rutgers, or UCLA, or Cambridge, or Oxford, or McGill in Canada, can teach you about your Lord. There's no way in the world, these high schools in this city, or any other city, or the private ones, Catholic or otherwise, 
can teach you about your Lord and protect you from that fire of which the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said that this fire seeks refuge with Allah from that fire. That this fire. And I'm not a scientist. I don't know what's the hottest fire in this existence. Is it the sun or volcanoes or what? Is it the sun? Somebody tell me. The sun. It's the hottest fire in this existence. That ball of fire up there. There's another one? Well, whatever it is. The hottest fire in this existence seeks refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from that fire in the next life. And you'll send your children to the place that's going to send them to that? لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. I wouldn't care if it was a thousand dollars a month for tuition. There's some kind of way we can keep our children from going to that fire. And remember, Allah connected you first with your children in the ayah. Who and فسكم وأهليكم نارا. So where do you think you're going to go if they are going to go there? Because you're responsible. So the very first thing, brothers and sisters in Islam, is that we seek Islamic education. How can you even think about sending your children, if you think that you're forced, to the public schools and they don't know about their deen? This is what the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Acquisition of knowledge is an obligation on every single Muslim. We said these things time and time again, brothers and sisters. Once again, we don't want to belabor the issue. How is it that you allow your children to know more about American history, black history, polka dot history, whatever kind of history, and they don't know about their Lord and the scene? Right now, when you go home, inshallah, after this brief lecture, sit your children down, get a piece of paper, give them a pen, Ask them who are the top ten rappers. And then ask them who are the ten people out of the order that the Messenger of Allah said. Not in order, just any order you want to bring it. The ten people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised Jannah. See which side comes up the most. No, let's give you an easy one. Not the top ten rappers. The top ten songs from any one of the rappers. I guarantee you they know it. I guarantee at least they can get eight out of ten. It's a shame, brothers and sisters. And it starts with the Islamic education. One of the reasons that we are failing in this endeavor to rear our children Islamically and give them the best Islamic education, one of the reasons is that our priorities are not in place. We think, for some strange reason, that we have to compete with the kuffar. Why do you want to compete with the people who Allah says, أُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ شَرُّ الْبَرِيَةِ They are the worst of creatures. Why do you want to compete with them? Why? Their goals are only the dunya. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَمَا لَهُمْ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقَ And there are of mankind who say, Oh our Lord, give us this world. And they don't have any portion in the next life. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّاسِ And there are other people from among mankind whom we ask Allah to make us of them, I mean, who say, Oh our Lord, give us not life, not حَيَاتُ الدُّنْيَا because الْحَيَاتُ الدُّنْيَا is nothing but غُرُور مَتَاعُ الْغُرُور It's an illusion and it's cursed. There are other enough mankind who say, Oh, our Lord, give us the good in this world and the good in the hereafter and defend us from the torment of the fire. Ya ayyuha ladina amanu qu anfuzukum wa ahlikum nara. Oh, you who believe, save yourselves and your families from the fire. You see what the people who have intelligence, you hear what they say? Oh, our Lord, give us the good in this world. Not just give us the world. Not just give us the life. They're very selective. Give us the good in this world. Why? It's because if we are allowed to get from Allah's ni'mah, from his, his grace and his fadl, his bounty, the good of this world, as a direct result of getting the good of this world, we're going to get the good of the next world. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his infinite mercy and grace, is going to protect us from the torment of the fire. It starts with the educational process of the parents, not the children. 
How can you even help your children with their homework if you don't know it yourself? You send them to the Islamic school, they come home in the evening, if they brought their book bag, well, some of them leave them in the school, unintentionally of course. You get the child home, for those of you who are concerned. You sit them in front of you, at the kitchen table or whatever. They open up their notebook, and the basic fundamentals of Tawheed you don't even know. But if Luther Van Vogt came on television, ellipsis, you ready to turn it on, you rush into the TV. SubhanAllah, brothers and sisters in Islam, the first responsibility that we have is Islamic education. Whether it's in a hut, whether it's in the backseat of a car, or an elaborately sublime, illustrious looking, magnificent seeming building. It doesn't make any difference. We still have the responsibility of educating our children. It doesn't make any difference where it is, as long as they know who their Lord is. So when they hit that grave, and all of us are going to hit that grave, just like our sister Rose, Abdul Rahman, who died yesterday. When they hit that grave, they are going to say, when the angels say, Man Rabbuka, who is your Lord? We don't want our children, and firstly ourselves, because you're not going to be concerned about your children on that day. See, on that day, you're not going to be concerned about your children. You want to be able to say, Rabbi Allahu, my Lord of Allah. You don't want to say, uh, 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 I said what I heard the people say. Because this is what the Prophet said, the other people are going to say. When the angels ask, Madinuka, what is your deen? We want to be able to say, Deen il Islam. My deen is Islam. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's angels are going to ask our children and firstly ourselves, of which we should be concerned about, Mandabiyuka, who is your prophet? We want to be able to say Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They can't learn that in the public schools. They can't learn that in the colleges. They can't learn that in the universities. So the first responsibility, brothers and sisters in Islam, is to educate our children. Unfortunately, some parents don't know enough about Islam. And some other parents don't want for some strange reason their children to compete with them. So they keep their children ignorant. No, it's, it's true. Some parents don't want to have their children compete with them in knowledge. Why? Why don't they want their children to learn as much or as more as them? It's because they're not living the correct Islamic lives. They don't want their children to become Islamically educated so their children can correct them. Because when you send them to the Islamic day school, and they learn that they have to make their salah and surround their salah with the sunnahs. And then they also learn that the, for the men they have to pray in the masjid. And it's obligatory for them to pray in the masjid. And you praying at home like a woman. Just maybe this is one of the reasons why you don't want them to be educated. Or when they see you smoking that cigarette. And he says, Abby, it's haram. Ummi. It's haram. Go in your room and look at TV. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanuqu anfusukum wa ahlikum nara. O you who believe, save yourselves and your family from the fire. Kullukum ra'in. Kullukum ra'in. All of you are shepherds. Wa kullukum mas'oolun anu ra'iyatihi. And all of you are going to be held accountable. Responsible for those who are under your charge. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us children. And children, as we've mentioned with the hadith, along with our wives, can be either a source of our felicities in the next life or punishment. Listen to what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said about children 
and the responsibility that we have of those children. He said, مَنْ كَانَ لَهُ ثَلَاثُ بَنَاتِ فَصَبْرَ عَلَيْهِنَّ And this is for those who think that having boys, when your wife has a boy, and you're overjoyed because he has a, you have a boy, this is for those who have that problem, like the pagan Arabs in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, before the Qur'an was revealed, when they used to bury their girl babies alive, and they used to bite their fingernails in rage because, ya rahmatullah, because of having girl babies. Listen to what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said about children, specifically the girls, to show you their place of importance. مَنْ كَانَ لَهُ ثَلَاثَ بَنَاتٍ فَصَبْرَ عَلَيْهِنَّ وَأَطْعَمَهُنَّ وَسَقَاهُنَّ وَكَسَاهُنَّ وَكَسَاهُنَّ بِجِدِّهِ بِجِدِّتِهِ كُنَّ لَهُ حِجَابًا مِنَ النَّارِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Whoever has three daughters and was patient when he was rearing them and he clothed them and he fed them, gave them their sustenance. Three daughters. They, those three daughters will be a protection for him from the hellfire. It doesn't make any difference if you have two from this wife, one from that wife. It doesn't make any difference. One from that wife, two from that wife. Three from this wife, or from a former wife, two, and another one from the new wife. It doesn't make any difference. If you do this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use these girls as a hijab, as a protection from the fire. So how could it be that we don't take the responsibility of rearing our children properly, giving them the best Islamic education, especially the girls? Again, the Prophet وسلم, because some people had some concern about how many girls. He said, any Muslim who has two daughters and is a good companion to them will enter heaven because of them. Anyone among the Muslims who has two daughters and is a good companion to them. What does good companion mean? It means you let them hang out with you, you sit them on your lap, you take them for a ride, take them to the museum. Is that what it means? No. A good companion means you taught them the things that are going to give them the good of this life and the good of the here. You taught them about their Rabb, about their Lord, about their Prophet, about being tenacious on their prayer, about staying out of men's faces and wearing the hijab. About not backbiting and not gossiping and not slandering people. And not lying. Of which we foster in the children. Ring, 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 ring. Yes. Is Fatima my home? Tell them I'm not here. Tell them I'm not here. You lie. And you teach your children to lie. Whoever's a good companion to these two girls, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam said, they will enter heaven because of the two girls. Because of the two daughters. And again, on the authority of Jabir ibn Abdullah, رضي الله عنه, he said, the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said, whoever has three daughters that he provides a dwelling for, supports and has mercy on them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet said, heaven is guaranteed as a reward. صدق رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. And I see some of the brothers right now, and I can't see some of the women who are overjoyed because they have these girls. I see some head shaking, they, you know, wow. Guaranteed reward, Jannah. Some of us have done a lot of things that we have to repent for. This is one little key. One little key. Maybe a ticket. One way to Jannah. The second thing, brothers and sisters in Islam, is the Islamic identity. And this problem, the problem that we have, which falls under the responsibility that we have, is probably directly related, and Allah knows best, to the education. The Islamic identity. As we mentioned earlier, we don't have the right priorities. 
for some reason we want to compete with the kuffar. So we lose our identity. Our culture is Islam. This is our culture. The customs that the Muslim should have should be Islamic. But unfortunately, we are not only allowing our children to lose their identity just having the name Abdullah and the name Sakina, but we're promoting, we're promoting the loss of our children's identity. Look at the way we allow them to dress and we contribute to the way they dress by buying it. When we buy these 70 and 80 dollar sneakers for a 10 year old who doesn't pray, what do you think kind of, what kind of message do you think you send them? A 75, maybe that's too cheap, a hundred dollar pair of sneakers. I don't think you can get too many 60 and 70 pairs now. I mean the ones they want to wear. I think they're a hundred dollars a piece. A hundred dollar pair of sneakers for a 10 year old and he doesn't even pray? I mean, even if he prays, you shouldn't be buying those sneakers for a hundred dollars. But he doesn't even pray. He's disobedient. And we're fostering. We're fostering with the baggy pants, with the sneakers, with the hairdo, the loss of their identity. Wallahi, brothers and sisters in Islam, it's extremely important that we keep our identity. Because there's going to be no difference between us and the Arabs. And I'm not picking on the Arabs. But some folks need to be picked on. Like the Arabs who came to this continent and because they got lost in the sauce, they changed their name from Muhammad to Mo, from Mikhail to Michael, from Fatima to Mary, I can't find one with an F, to whatever, Frida. Just totally lost. Totally lost. I remember, and this is just for an adult, how, what's, how much more children? I remember a brother when I was working in the prison system in New York State, I was teaching him something, an Arab from Jordan, Muslim, alhamdulillah. He came to this country and he was in a class of mine. He started crying. He was complaining about how far away from Islam he had gotten. This is an adult, 54 years old. He was saying that he knew he had gone over the limit because his nephew had sent him a letter from Amman, Jordan, saying, Happy Eid. And he didn't even know what Eid it was. He didn't know if it was Fitr or Azha. And we, we continue to be engrossed, absorbed by this culture, quote unquote, this society, not thinking that the identity of the Muslim is one of the main facets of his or her life that's going to save them. Let me give you an example. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and now I'm directly, I'm, I'm shooting this, this example directly towards clothing. The Prophet ﷺ, when he was about to do a raid on a village, for those who tried to say that Islam wasn't spread by the sword. When the Prophet ﷺ was about to do a raid on a village, he and his illustrious companions, or Allahu anhum, would sit at the edge of the city or the town. And they'd wait for one thing. If they heard it, they wouldn't attack. And if they didn't hear it, they would attack. That was the Azan. Why is that so important? It's because if you don't look like a Muslim, and I'm walking down the street and you're getting beat down, I'm not going to help you. Why should I help you? I can't even identify you. So you need to be beat down. Now what are we doing when we send our children out into the street and they look just like the enemy? They look just like the people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has cursed. What are we doing? And then we expect the Islamic day school to come and be Mr. Clean? Clean them up for me here. Throw them in the, in the Islamic day school. Now you take care of it. I destroyed them for 12 years, now you take care of them. You straighten it out. For 15 years, I let them do what they wanted to do. Now I want you to take care of it three hours a day. Five hours a day. Eight hours a day, we have to redo or undo the damage that you Muslim terrorists 
have perpetrated on our children. And I say our children. Why? Kullukum ra'in. Because all of you, all of us, are shepherds. The identity is important, brothers and sisters in Islam. Our children need to be happy. If they're forced to go, and I use that word loosely, to go to the public school, we know that they're badgered if they wear kufi or wear khimar. We know that they're ridiculed. Don't let them take it off. Let them keep their identity. Let them be proud to be Muslim. In addition to this, brothers and sisters in Islam, the parents, the teachers, we can't become indifferent to the Qur'an and the Sunnah. We have to make the Qur'an and the Sunnah paramount in our lives. When you come home from a hard day's work, the men of Islam, and when you, those women, who are also compelled to work, come home from work, and unfortunately that's the case for many of us, and may Allah give us a situation that none of them, them, meaning the women, have to do this. Because so many thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of hours are lost from that child's education when the women have to go out. When you come home from a hard day's work, you should sit down with your children, review the Quran with them, find out if they understand the hadith that they learned today. Check their, their thinking out. Because when they go out to these streets, even if they're not hanging out in the street, just going through to get to the Islamic day school or whatever school, they're being affected. They're being bombarded. There's no scud missile that the Kofar has built that's worse than some of the things that's going on in these streets right now. Or worse than what's going on in the public school right now. Wallahi al I swear by Allah the tremendous. Wallahi al Wallahi al Three times, alhamdulillah, I love to say this. A scud missile wouldn't be as tumultuous as what they're learning in public school. If a stud missile hit Central High School right now, across the street, with the whole building filled up with children, it wouldn't be worse than what they're learning in them textbooks. Excuse me, correcting this, in those textbooks. It wouldn't be worse. Why? It's because at least if the scud missile hit the Islamic Day School, they die with Iman in their chest, and inshallah with Quran in their heart. At least, as I've always said in the past, I would rather be a Muslim with AIDS, dying with la ilaha illallah on my tongue and in my heart, than a kafir getting hooked, hit by a cookie truck and die in good health. The responsibility, we better start taking it, brothers and sisters. We are psychologically, educationally, culturally, socially, ethically destroying our children. We better take this responsibility as soon as we can. Inshallah, I'm praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that all of us will continue in this endeavor of trying to get the best education for our children. Helping.